Um, I guess you know who I am. I was in Star Wars. I'm sorry, I'm just reading my own biography here. Um, usually what I do is like, it's just easier just to go right to the questions, because then that way that kicks off other things as well. So, shall we start with some questions? What would be the first question first? There we go. I feel like an engineer. Here we go. Uh, Non-Star Wars related question. No. <laughs> how, how'd you like working on Space 1999? Well, it was really bizarre because um, it was the only episode that Martin Landau wasn't in. Really? Yeah. So, and I just met him at a show back in February. And, um, and so I met him for the first time. He's right. coming up to 90 now. You know? But I worked with his wife, Barbara, who's fantastic, fantastic. Wow. But it was good fun. I mean, it was one of those things that it was such a... I think I was the second victim of the microbe. I, like, I discovered the cure for the microbe, but it got me before I could tell Barbara Maine. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, so it was one of those. I was the second on the menu, just before the first commercial break. That was cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and moving on, another question. No? Well, we, come on, don't be shy, people. You, this is all we're here for. This is all we're here for. <laughs> Uh, I mean, surely, I, I just did a, you were all Star Wars fans, um, I just did a, an event, I, I was asked to give a talk at the German business, German-British business club of Dusseldorf uh, about three weeks ago, and these are like a bunch of crusty expats who have nothing to do with Star Wars, they're not into costumes or anything, they don't see any of this, and I got a German the German 501st Garrison, who are familiar with the, with the stormtroopers, who do fantastic charity work all over the world. There's like 5,500 of them now all over the world. Um, and so I got a Darth Vader and two stormtroopers to escort me into the dining room of this talk with these like 60 people. And these people, they don't go to events like this. They've never seen a Darth Vader except in the movie. So they were totally just in shock for the entire night. And the Darth Vader was very funny because he was going around choking people and having fun and we just had a ball with them. So the theme of the talk was that deep down inside everybody is a Star Wars fan. And, and that Q and they were asking me all kinds of amazing questions that you would, you know. So it's I'm sure there must be some questions here. Ah. Do you, do you have your own uh, Imperial officer outfit tucked away in the closet? No, sadly not. No, those, those uniforms, the first film, they were um, German uniforms, World War I uniforms, from a very famous film called All Quiet on the Western Front. And they were real uniforms. Uh, they used to be, and they would rent them out to movie companies, a big costume company would rent them out to movie companies. So those were beautifully made uniforms. Uh, very hot, because it was really heavy, beautiful wool. And when we shot the film, there was a drought in England that year, and it was about 98 degrees outside and about 100 degrees inside the studio, because all the lighting were the very big, old-fashioned Klieg arc lights. Uh, so it was incredibly hot, but the uniforms didn't look great. When the film became a big hit, then they went to polyester double knit, and they never looked as good as all the other films. If you look closely in episode six, the uniforms don't look that good. You know? <laughs> They're not as good as the first ones. How many days of shooting were in that, for the, that conference? Well, I was booked for five days, one, one film week. Because, and I just done, the week before, I was playing a, uh, I, I was in an English cop show playing an American drug dealer. And then I'd already been booked to do, uh, I was doing a play for the BBC uh, based on a movable feast by Ernest Hemingway playing Hemingway. And I'd all grown my Hemingway mustache and I was all ready to go. And then Star Wars came up and it slotted in between those two jobs. And it was absolutely perfect for my calendar. It was great. But they made me shave off my mustache. Yeah. And we shot and the we shot the conference room scene, and that did take four days to film, which is amazing. It was long, you know, four full days, because they have to cover every actor or extra, and they do it from every conceivable angle. And directors don't like shooting around the table uh, for that very reason, because it just slows the film up. Um, 
so then the last scene I had to do on the Friday was to be blowing up Alderaan. Right? So, but they had, uh, the special effect plate arrived from ILM, uh, which at that time was a garage in Van Nuys. It was, that's, they were kind of making all the special effects up as they went along. They didn't know what they were doing, basically. They were just trying stuff, you know. And one of the guys in ILM sent the plate and put in two cartons of cigarettes for the ILM guy in London. Right? And the plate got pulled by customers. <laughs> so we lost three days. Right? So um, George, everybody was kind of standing around and the first assistant said, look, we've got to shoot something. So they did all kinds of stormtrooper scenes. And I did... So they pulled Carrie and Mark in to do the swing across the chasm and the chase down the corridors. And so they were just had to fill time until they got this thing out of customs, which took two more days. So I didn't shoot again until the Wednesday, and we finally got the plate up, and the plate test didn't work, and we were done. And then somebody got, I don't know, they, I think somebody got balled out really badly, because that was expensive, two days to lose. So the upshot was that I'm the, one of the few actors who got overtime. <laughs> on Star Wars. They were really over budget and it was tight and they were really getting, they would cut scenes rather than shoot them to stay on budget. And, but the only the big problem was that I missed my first day of rehearsal and read through as Ernest Hemingway. I was playing the lead in this TV film, right? And I wasn't there because film companies have precedent over your contract at that time. If you're, even if you were signed to do a TV thing before, if you do a film, the film company has a precedent over some, some old union law, you know. So I was not very popular at the BBC when I turned up as well. And then they had to pay to make me a new mustache because I couldn't grow one in time for the shooting. So it was not, it was very strange. But I was one of the few people to get over to it. But it was one of those things. I mean, I actually, my favorite story about Star Wars is that I went to a casting session for it in Los Angeles and I was told by my agent that she said Lucas is making this space western and you know, we're going to go over to the Bronfman Studios and they're going to videotape you and this had never been done before. Now every actor is videotaped when they go to an audition. It was the first time that was done. So I go over and he saw 2,000 actors over two weeks. I mean, he was disappointed. Everybody went in, sat down, read the hand Rito scene with a casting assistant reading Rito. So you go in, you know, we, everybody does the scene and it's like, okay. But I didn't realize when I walked in the room, I didn't know who George Lucas was. I didn't know what he looked like. But I knew who Francis Ford Coppola was. I knew who Brian De Palma was. And I knew who John Milius was. And then the geeky guy with the beard must have been Lucas, because I know everybody else. So it was really awe-inspiring to walk into that room. Because you're taught, you're sitting with two of the top directors, three of the top directors. You know, everybody was there but Spielberg, you know. It was really scary. It was like, oh wow, okay. So uh, eight months later, I'm back in the UK, and I'm sent a script by my agent by the casting director, the UK casting director, for Roman Star Wars. So I'd already read for it and then say, send me a script, and it's one line. So I, I'm not doing that, you know. <laughs> it's 25, it's five years long. You know? Forget it, I'm not doing one, one line, no character, I'm not going to do it, so I turned it down. Um, and a friend of mine took that part, and he went up to Well Street, he sat around all morning and they gave him an imperial uniform with one of those silly hats, <laughs> which were really stupid. So. And uh, he sat there all day, uh, half a day, and then George came up to him at lunch and said, Bill, we've cut the scene, you can go home, but we'll pay you for the day. About £100, $179 for this day's work. Uh, and he wasn't in the mood. And then a month later, they sent me another script. And I was like, oh, wait, this is character name, I, got, I don't know what a Darth Vader is, but he's obviously a badass. <laughs> I get choked by him, so it's like a cool scene. I, no idea what a Death Star or anything was, but it's like, hey, well, I'll do that. That's cool. So my friend who did, he's never let me live it down, because he was like, well, God, 
might have gone the other way. So, you, know, you, you, know, you took the point. You were fool. More fool you. You took the one line part. You know. So anyway, so that kind of led on to a few things. Another question. Are you a Star Wars fan? As my Star Wars fan. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. Have you watched all the rest of the sequels? Oh God, yeah, yeah. I mean, my I came home one afternoon, you know, a couple few years ago. My son was about no, fifteen, and he's watching Empire. I thought, what are you watching Empire for? He says, it's a really cool film. So I sat down. We watched it, and I watched the Clone Wars with my goddaughter, who's nine. Uh, I watched the trilogy with my son when he was like five. Um, so yeah, you know, you know, I'm a Star Wars fan. It was, a, it was a, when I read the script the first time, it broke all the rules of being a script. It was 153 pages long, far too much narrative. The dialogue was not very good, but the story was terrific. And that's what it comes down to. It's like the story, and I figured that they could do those special effects. They, they wouldn't be making a movie if they couldn't. You know, I didn't know at the time that they couldn't do the special effects. They, it was a leap of faith by 20th Century Fox that got the film made. Right? But yeah, I'm a great Star Trek fan. You know, but I'm not a great. It's, I don't read a lot of science fiction. I don't like read Asimov or any of those guys. No, but I'm, I like sci-fi movies. I like movies you know. I'm really. I'm looking forward to Prometheus. Yeah, I love Day of the Alien. It's just one of those great, perfect side so, uh, um, The other thing that I loved a few years ago, which I thought the reboot was fantastic, was Battlestar Galactica. Because they just took that, it was kind of a hackneyed story back in the 80s, and they actually just breathed new life into it. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant stuff. So, I am a Star Wars. I am a new side of life. And a Star Trek, Star Wars. Yes. Having worked with a lot of different directors, what was your uh, opinion of George Lucas as far as his style of directing? <coughs> well, he was kind of, he was one of those guys that was a, he always says he casts well. And basically, that's the type of director that lets you get on with it. And he does cast well. I mean, he's, you know, he, he puts it together because he's got, He's got the film kind of running in his head. He's now that he can actually see a little screen there, and he's watching the film in his head, and he's composing. He, he composites things, and he kind of lets the actor leaves the actors alone to get on, um, which is a really great director as far as I'm concerned. Because the directors who mess around with you too much and want too much, then it gets to be difficult. You know? And because if somebody meddles that much, you're never really going to give them what they want. Do other actors appreciate that as well? That you work yeah, with? well, no, is there another actor kind of who like to be directed, like to be really said, I have to, you know, and I've had directors say, you have to go say this line at this mark, you know, they put things on the floor for you and say, I want you to hit that line there and say that line, and if you don't do it, you'll just do 50 takes, you know, I, I mean, it's crazy. But like, another, the last big film that I did before I stopped acting was Roger Rabbit. And that was required such precision from all the actors because everything had to be done on the mark, on the line. And then they had four cameras around you, two VistaVision cameras, which were really wide angle lenses, and then two Panaflex cameras. So they would have a 360 degree plane for the animators to work in. Then, they, then the animators would go off and they were able to get everything into that from different angles. Now you can make Roger Rabbit in a Mac thing. You know? But in 1986, it was no, it was hard work, you know. Um, but that required a great deal of precision, you know. And the director knew that, and they, so he kind of just kept us all happy, you know, as we went through it. So he couldn't, he had to, he had to open direct us. But it was for a reason. I mean, I've had other actors, directors who just met with TV directors here. Yeah. And usually directors that were the quietest, like George, are probably usually the best. Because they know what they're doing. And they know the film's going to be made in the editing room, not on the set. That's why. So, another question. <laughs> well, my girlfriend at the time, later my wife, was Sarah Douglas, who played Ursa. And there was a. Uh, 
they were actually shot that sequence outside of London in a place called Chobham Common where they built that town. Uh, and the actor doing the role couldn't do it. There was an accident. So I was a last minute replacement. So I did it as a, you know, and they, I helped them out to get them off, to get them off of that set. They only had three days on that location. So it was like a big favor, but I did charge them a lot of money because they were not, you know, there was other reasons as well for that, that you know, I can't go into it like the video. But it was, um, yeah, and I, yeah, so it was interesting to do that. I mean, I, I had, uh, I, it was just fun to do, you know. Um, I don't think the film held, has held up. A lot of people disagree with me, but I mean, I don't think that I saw it six months ago. But it's, still, you know, it's not as good as the first one. But it, is, you know, but it was a different director. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Donner one? Yeah, the Donner one is much better. And Donner couldn't really save, Donner kind of Superman 2 couldn't really save it either. You know, it's just because it wasn't there to begin with. Uh, I could go on about that director, but I'm going to Another question? Any other, anything else? Well, I'll, I'll ask one of them. Okay, please do. Jump in. How, how many uh, times have fans come to you and said, I find your lack of faith disturbing? <laughs> More times than I could possibly <laughs> I think Well, that's okay. I mean, I, mean, I don't, I, I did for a while. I did used to do, the, you know, people would ask me and I would do that. And I, and then my eldest daughter saw me on a website. And uh, I don't do that anymore, so don't ask. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's you know, finished with that now. But it's, uh, no, I, I cannot, you know, I'm, <laughs> that's so often. I mean, and also, it is the most parodied scene from Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, everybody does it. I mean, I saw it on a rerun of, of Big Bang Theory the other night, where Sheldon, and like he's done, he did it to Joss Whedon in one episode, the one I saw. But he said he does do. He's done it before. It's become a thing with him. So, so that's a, that's an honor. It really is. I mean, I, I found out the other day from it's a, it's a TV poll in the UK, but it's still you know I still consider it valid that the that scene is the 35th most famous movie moment of all time. Out of 100, it's 35. Starting with Casablanca, that's number one, the parallel in Casablanca. So it's not bad, you know, top 50. I think I'm also around Cool Hand Luke and, and, the, and, the, and, and Butch and Sundance jumping off the, uh, off the cliff in, in Butch, Butch Castle and Sundance. Yeah. So it's not bad company to be. You know, it's pretty cool. So, and also, I love the Eddie. I mean, has anyone seen the Death Star Canteen where he's hack people in the yeah. train? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. absolutely hilarious. It's my favorite Star Wars parody. <laughs> anyway, you were going to ask? Oh, uh, yeah, just one more. Uh, being in all these movies and productions, is it, are you able to watch them and just really get absorbed in the movies? Or are you always thinking like about your performance or about other people on the screen? Like, oh, that was a nice guy. He was Oh yeah, no, no, you do. I mean, you, it's very hard to do that. Although, with, but Star Wars is was is the exception to the rule because uh, I didn't see. Usually, they have a cast and crew screening after the film is completed, and I was working at the time. I was filming in the south of France. It was fantastic. I missed the cast and crew screening, and when I finally got around to seeing the movie, then that was I was there. That was in June. And I was away in France filming for the best part of six weeks. And then when I came back, the film had gone gangbusters in the States. And I and indeed started seeing all the press, the world press, of what this phenomenon of Star Wars was. So I went to see Star Wars when it opened in London with a paying audience. And I took my girlfriend Sarah and her niece and nephew and mother and sisters, so it was a big family outing, and we went to see Star Wars in the 2000 season movie theater in London, with 2,000 people, and it was just like, whoa, I couldn't believe it. As soon as that opening shot unfolded, it was like, I, I'm in, I kept thinking, I was like, I'm in this <laughs> I was completely captivated, but on other occasions, you will think, <laughs> or I remember that day. But I mean, there's, 
most thankfully, they're few and far between that you, you, know, you really want to see. You know, Louis Jordan in Octopussy was a complete sense. <laughs> it's just an Aristo, French Aristo, this stuff that I mean, used terrible. Whereas Roger Moore was my least favorite Bond, was the most fun guy to spend a week with on the set, you know. He was just fantastic, so, you know. I Louis Jordan, jerk. Absolutely jerk. Take it. I don't know whether he's still alive or not. I don't know whether he's still anyway. Right, before I wrap on somebody else, sorry. Just add one more question. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, the uh, the re-releases re on like Blu-ray and DVD? The changes George Lucas has made to the well, you know, hand shot first, right? Yeah. <laughs> I have to say any more about it. I think that's it. You know. Uh, yeah, I just don't. Nobody knows. Nobody really deep down likes it. But hey, listen, it's his toy. This guy's there. It's his painting. He wants to change it. He wants to change it anyway. It's not. Fans don't own it. See, it's his thing. He may respond to the fans. I mean, he put in he put in the uh, the big star glider sequence, uh, you know, after 30 years, which is the Luke's best friend on Tatooine, and that whole sequence was cut out of the movie. And the actor who plays Biggs now shut up because he's been going on about it for <laughs> 30 years that he was cut out of the movie. So now, so you, now you can shut up. You're done, okay? You're in the movie, finally. No, it's, it's, you do Q&As and panels with him that he would just, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, sorry, you had a question. When you set out your career, did you quote films or Oh yeah, everybody wants to be in movies, but I mean, I, I, I was really happy in the theater. I was having, I was having a great time in the theater in England and, and Europe. I was touring and uh, and that's some really pretty good American plays, and I was quite happy. Uh, but I was with a really good little touring company when I got my first film, which is a, a film called Stardust, which was about a rock band with David Essex, who was a big rock star at the time in the seventies. And I tell you, when I got off, I was working. I was working in a, in a youth club in Rotterdam. With I, my hair down on my shoulders, we were doing youth theater for un, underprivileged youth in, in Rotterdam. And I got on a plane at five o'clock and flew from Hook of Holland to London. And I was on a film set at seven o'clock, having my hair cut. And I was given the suit that I'd been already had fittings for. So so I thought I was transformed into an American lawyer. But as soon as I got onto a film set, I was like, oh yeah, this is everything I hoped it would be. And I had a great time, because my first film is always a little difficult. But I was supposed to be playing with Tony Curtis, who is the actor who buys up this young, brings his British rock band to the States, and then kills them, basically, kills the kid. You know? um, so, Tony Curtis got busted for marijuana in Hawaii two months before. I don't know whether you remember that story about him, but he was kind of flipped out. And he did, wasn't approved by the studio. So they said, okay, you're having Larry Hagman. So they went from like, like Jewish American manager, you know, like the Albert, the, the Robert, Albert Klein type of character to, who's Larry Hagman? He was in I Dream a Genie. So everybody didn't know that he, Larry was like born and bred in Texas. You know? So he arrives and he said, well, I'm just going to play him like Colonel Tom Parker. Of course, I, what, he was, what he was doing was the embryo of J.R. You see, so I was at the beginning, I was at the birth of J.R. You know? And the bigger irony is, because he now lives a very good life now, uh, Larry had more drugs with him than Tony Curtis could even imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so it was. <laughs> so it was a complete turnaround for the film company after Columbia, the studio. They couldn't, you know, because Larry was at that time. He was called the Mad Monk of Malibu. He was totally mad. Um, just a crazy, wonderful man. He was, and he still is by all accounts. I mean, he had, he had a good time. I mean, he got. He had to have a new liver. So let's say, you know, he had a good life. And he's back again, it's JR as well. So what the hell? I wish I hope I'm doing something that much fun at 80. <laughs> anyway, another question. Just I uh, just want to point out this would have to be the last. If we have one more question, this would have to be the last question. So we have another panel coming up. Okay. Anyone else?
Oh. Ah. Did you get to keep anything from Star Wars? Or no, I wish I did. I wish I did. You know, even those things, you know, those things that they put, I can't say what the prop man actually uh -huh. said to me, but those little things, you know, in your pocket, they put these in the pocket. But the guy, prop man, came up and he asked him, what are these? He said, <laughs> <laughs> and they were made out of wood. They were turned on a lathe in the prop store at Elstree and then sprayed with silver paint, you know. <laughs> Later on, they made them out of aluminum. But I wish I, wish I kept them. Uh, my friend Paul, who played Greedo, he stole his he stole the blaster. <laughs> <laughs> and his kids played with it and they broke it and then it got lost in a mood. So I was with it, we were with a, a serious collector uh, at a show once and, and Paul said, if my blaster was around, how much would it be worth? <laughs> Because the, the, the lightsabers had just gone for $98,000 and $92,000 for Luke and, and Dave, Darth Vader's lightsaber. And Greedo's Blaster, forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 at auction. Jesus. He went to all the trouble of stealing it. And I kept my scripts, which would have been worth a lot of money, but not as much as a physical prop. But my scripts would be worth, you know, $10,000 now. Uh, but they were both stolen. You know, one was lost by the movers, and the other one was lent to a friend while I was away by my ex-wife. Uh, <laughs> and he disappeared. And so I don't have any of my scripts. Was that it would have gone one of my kids through school. <laughs> college. It would have been that would have been that sort of sad. Anyway. All right, well, we have to wrap up. So right. thank, you. thank you very much. Oh